the superintendent take the roll call, please? Uh, sure. Our SAU 50 rep, Maria Emery. Hello. Oh, okay. hi. hi. Liz Barrett. Here. Pip Clues. Here. Lisa Rappaport. Here. Ann Walker. Here. Margo Peabody. Here. Lisa <coughs> Faber. Here. Old Van Epps. Here. Brian French. Carrie Nolte. Here. Kimberly Malinci. Here. Nick Dowell. Here. Okay. Can we all stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have the acceptance of the April, tw I guess we can do them both at the same time. Move to approve. The April 12th Second. regular, okay. Um, <laughs> if I can, uh, I think I was put in for, I believe it was the alcohol uh, minutes. I am in as the teacher representative. Good job. Oh, man. okay. Oh. <laughs> that was a big promotion. Good job. Yeah, I'm honored. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we will change that to student representative. <laughs> See what a good job we do at Portsmouth High School? Um, okay, thank you, Nick. Any other comments about the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. One abstention. Oh, oh okay, thank you. Um, Steve, can you take us into special presentations? Public comment. Public comment? Oh, I'm sorry, public comment. I believe we have one public comment. Can you give us your name and address, please? Absolutely. And you have three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just get on my phone? Because I got to have my own timer here. It would be great. Um, my name is Joe Krause, and I live at 56 Ruby Road in Portsmouth. I'm gonna stop. Okay, um, thank you for having me. I obviously was here last week, and thinking about the policy, quite a bit since then and one of the one of the things that we really fought about was the terminology and the presence of and it seemed like the the board was swaying toward getting rid of it and I think that was a a big mistake. So you had said that it wasn't a deterrent, that there was no proof of it being a deterrent. And I looked up and I, I didn't find anything that said it was a deterrent. But if we think about the basic uh, truths, I think about drinking and kids, I think that we can come to the conclusion that it is a deterrent for a couple of reasons. One is that if a kid is in the vicinity of alcohol, they are at a much greater chance of drinking. You know, if a kid is going to, um, drink they're um, if they're sitting with their kid with friends watching a movie they're m much less likely to drink than if they're in a house full of alcohol um, so the other th truth is that a lot of kids or probably most kids who start drinking don't want to um, they're resistant to it they do it for because of they're pressured and um, when they're pressured they're invariably if they do manage to have the uh, wherewithal to say why or to say no then they're asked why, okay? And they might have a variety of reasons that they learn in health class or my parents, or the, um, I don't wanna get in trouble at school or the police, right? But none of those really hold up in this. They, they don't sound good to, in a pressure situation. But this policy gives them a, a why in this situation. Why don't I want to drink or go to this party is because I want, I, it's important to be on the soccer team. It's important to be on NHS. Um, I, I don't want to risk my scholarship. This is a valid reason to give to people. And so this policy I think is very important because it not only keeps kids from drinking, but keeps them away from this dangerous situation that um, puts them in a much graver risk of doing this. I think that um, we, the school needs to be united with the police and with the community to really say, we don't want, we're, we're gonna try to help you not drink. We're gonna put this in place so you can have this ammunition to say, I, you know, I'm not going to. I, I can guarantee you that so, if there was a party this weekend that some kids would be saying, you know, I'm not gonna go after what happened to these kids. I'm not gonna put myself at risk. I've got a lot to risk. Um, I think there are maybe some p problems with the policy as far as not um, making it educated enough in the beginning, so it's right on the forefront, but I think the policy itself is solid, and I think it's a, a valuable asset to our school to be involved, and I think if we take it away, it will tie the hands of the administration to say we want to hold these kids accountable and, and we don't want them to drink so 
Okay. So let's thank and um, one last thing. Thank you for coming out tonight. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I know you thank and I you have talked, and yeah. I, I appreciate you taking the time. And one last thing, um, I'd be happy to come back. Um, you know, I can't get enough of these meetings. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if anyone wants to email me and talk or whatever, I'd be happy to do it. I, I, I enjoyed the discussion. Okay. okay. I probably won't thank stay you, for the whole Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Yeah. Do we have anyone else for public comment? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Maybe I'm on have everybody anyone? on Zoom. Second, please. Uh, do we have anyone in our virtual audience that would like to raise a hand and participate in public comment? We have three people, so. Okay. Um, <coughs> seeing none, I think we can close. Okay, we will close the public comment session, and now we will go to a special presentation and Steve with our middle school people. Yeah, so I will, I will turn it over um, as you had requested um, a presentation for each level around general disciplinary practices, philosophy around discipline, procedure, etc. Um, I've invited Phil Davis, uh, who is here with Rob Munson and Tim Hodgson, to present to you uh, a little bit about um, the middle school's um, disciplinary practices. So I'm going to turn it over to Phil Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for coming. Thank you for having me. And I will uh, will share this presentation with myself, uh, Assistant Principal Tim Hodgson, and uh, School Resource Officer, <coughs> excuse me, Detective Munson. And so I, I want to just kind of start by, you know, acknowledging the fact that we do have, obviously, three different levels intentionally of schools, right? So we have the elementary schools, we have middle schools, we have high schools. And I think it's important in this discussion, when you're thinking about behavior and discipline, to also think about, well, there are appropriately three different levels of disciplinary procedures and behavioral expectations. And as I, if for any of folks that have been uh, parents in the school or if you've ever been to a, a presentation, I talk to parents or uh, staff and sometimes even students, we talk about brain development. Um, and, and I think middle school is a good, a good time to remind folks uh, just of a couple things, and I'm not going to go on a long spiel about brain development, that's not why we're here, and I'm no neurologist. Um, <coughs> but there are really two key areas of the brain I think that are important to think about in this discussion, and one being the prefrontal cortex, um, which is you know, the front of the brain, and I look at my notes here, it talks about planning complex cognitive, be cognitive behavior, uh, personality expression, decision making, and controlling social behavior. <laughs> That part of the brain, a lot of studies show during middle school ages, is shrinking. <laughs> Just really maybe not a surprise. Uh, and, and in its absence, uh, an adolescent brain reverts to uh, the amygdala, which is what we think of as the flight or uh, the fight or flight response. Um, so that's the part of your brain that stresses, senses danger, it signals your brain to pump stress hormones, prepare your body to. Uh, enter either a fight for survival or flee to safety. So I think when you when you think about middle schoolers, when you think about behavior, when you think about discipline, you have to think about what's going on inside the brain. Um, I think, uh, as as many of you know, and uh, certainly the folks at the middle school know, we focus a lot on relationships. Um, students to students. Uh, Relationships are key, they're huge, they are the, the biggest and most important thing, and not relationships necessarily with teachers but or with their parents, uh, but relationships with their peers. Uh, but we have changed things and stressed uh, over the last many years, uh, ensuring that all students have at least one adult, and, and hopefully more than one adult, uh, that they have a relationship with, they have a go-to person, they have someone that they can, uh, can get them out of a pinch when they are going to that fight or flight uh, brain. Um, we've also done a lot of work over the last couple years on trauma-informed um, kind of schools, trauma-informed instruction, um, and ways that we can uh, approach things a little bit differently when, <clears throat> when a student or any student is um, having a difficult time. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of education and, and as we are in this point in time where we're hiring different folks to uh, you know, work in different positions, and we we've, we've asked different teachers about you know what do they know about ACE scores and trauma informed instruction. We're a little surprised that a lot of people just 
it's new to them. They don't really know a whole lot of it. And so I, th I think we feel like we're doing, you know, if that is the right direction, and I feel that it is, we're doing a good job of, of um, really thinking about brain development, about past experiences, and treating every student as an individual. Um, so I, I think it is important, again, just to remember that elementary, middle, high school should likely have different approaches um, to discipline to meet the brain development and, and cognitive needs of that. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Tim Hodgson for a minute, and he's uh, going to kind of walk through some data, some things that we are seeing at the middle school, um, what some of our most common uh, disciplinary infractions are, and uh, break that apart, and then I'll be back in a moment's time. <laughs> So this is my uh, 11th year running operations in a uh, school, and uh, I will say that Ports Middle School is probably one of, uh, this year has been probably my most successful year uh, in terms of data for, uh, for discipline. And, and really the basis of that is our, our teachers. Our, our teachers really do, do a tremendous job developing relationships with kids, uh, communicating with parents, uh, setting uh, behavioral expectations with kids. Um, the Kind of one of the, the tenets of that is, uh, and Phil hit on it right there, is we always ask our kids before you make a bad choice, find a trusted uh, adult. And you see examples of that all throughout our day. You, you When you walk around the hallways, uh, you'll see teachers pulling kids out. You go down to our lunchroom and you have teachers on their lunch breaks going down and meeting with kids. Um, and all that work really helps us out because it really keeps the number of office referrals down, which only allows us uh, it allows us to kind of not be so handcuffed to the office. We can walk around the hallways, patrol the bathrooms, be out there and be very visible, which again, helps with our, our discipline numbers. So looking at this year, uh, traditionally the past four or five years, we've averaged anywhere between 110 and 130-ish office referrals a year. Uh, currently, right now, we're about 67. Uh, so I'm projecting us to be sub uh, 100 unless the end of the year uh, it takes a, a really bad turn. Um, <laughs> If you look at our most common ones that we, we deal with, we deal with uh, class disruption, uh, inter inappropriate behavior. Uh, cell phone use is, is one that we deal with a lot because uh, we're one of the schools. We don't allow our kids to have open use of their cell phones. Uh, so kids uh, on occasion uh, will take out their cell phones when they're not allowed to. It's uh, kind of a middle school thing. Uh, and attendance concerns. Uh, those are the ones that we, we are kind of constantly working with and, and those numbers tend to be what the bulk of office referrals are about. Sorry, so that was, uh, can you just repeat class uh, disruption? The numbers. Yep. Inappropriate behavior, cell phone use, and attendance concerns are kind of the top four. Do you mind just repeating the numbers? Because I couldn't get them in my head fast yeah. enough. So if you look at the average number of office referrals per year, we're probably about 110 to 130, and this year we're at 67 as of yesterday when I pulled these data. Thank you for repeating. Yeah. So uh, trends, we don't have any major trends. I think the, the biggest thing, uh, every grade level uh, has uh, somewhat equal uh, number of officer referrals. Sixth grade tends to be a little lower. Uh, those kids kind of come in, I call it the sixth grade honeymoon. Uh, they usually don't really pop, start popping for us until uh, <laughs> Columbus Day weekend. Uh, so we have that uh, going for us. We have about a six week break, so that kind of skews their numbers, but it's usually pretty, pretty even across the board. Um, if you look at existing discipline levels of responses, we have a variety of ones that we use at, at PMS. Our, uh, and the keto model is communication. Uh, our teachers are always communicating with home, whether emails, phone calls, uh, messages, um, You know, even if it's something uh, that doesn't require discipline, which again, really helps out with that. Uh, uh, with our numbers, but we use everything from teacher lunch detentions, um, teacher op teacher det after school detentions, uh, office lunch detentions, office uh, regular detentions, in school suspensions, uh, suspensions. Um, those kind of measures are, are kind of the standard package that we we kind of build around. If you look at what happens when a kid is uh, sent to the office, uh, typically uh, what happens is uh, you know we'll get a kid that, that shows up. Uh, they sit outside a nice uh, little bench outside of my uh, my office, um, and, and usually what uh, we ask is the teacher communicates you know why they're there. Um, on occasion, the middle schoolers that we deal with uh, have a different viewpoint of why they're there, and <laughs> they'll say, "Oh, I was just doing my work," um, and they forget about exactly what the behavior was. So uh, we ask our teachers to uh, communicate with us. Uh, we prefer them to put it in writing because uh, sometimes we're moving around. Um, oftentimes, I'll catch wind of something just because you know I'm moving around, so I already have the information when I get down there. Because uh, I like knowing the answers to the questions before I ask the children. That's uh, one of the things I, I, I like. Uh, 
Um, so once we have a, ki a conversation with a kid and kind of uh, establish, you know, what uh, the offense was, uh, then it's a, you know, in a conversation, uh, sometimes Phil and I will bind some things off each other, uh, kind of look at past precedent, look at where the kid's at, and then we'll assign a consequence. Uh, we are, we, we do a lot of individualized consequences, because again, our, our goal ultimately, uh, and the goal of ultimately any behavioral system is, is to not have a repeated behavior. So that's uh, a lot of uh, conversations. You know, we, we try to bring the families in uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we prefer, I know Phil and I both prefer phone calls to, to families rather than uh, emails. I know that's not, we're not always able to do that just because our days do tend to get a, a little bit out of control. But, uh, you know, we do prefer to pick up the phone and have a conversation with the parent uh, and ask them for, get, explain the situation and ask them for some support in uh, backing us up. I'll tag uh, Phil in yeah. now for a little you bit. I'm just going to sit next to oh. you if that's all right. Okay. Well. So we're not back and forth and yeah. back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> you guys might want to just move the mic a little closer because it has to pick up. Does that work oh. maybe a little just bit? Better? Yeah, here. Oh, you look. can each up one of these. More for people listening online. All right. There you go. The four people. Six people. Oh, he's <laughs> on TV, too. Yes, yeah, three. Um, <laughs> it's going to be rebroadcast. It's going to be a lot of hits. Ratings, too. Yeah. Right. Through the roof. Through the roof. Um, Going viral. There are six, Phil. Just so you know. <laughs> you can see it. There are six. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the questions so uh, that uh, Margo had sent to us was, uh, she kind of said, it's just some areas you may want to hit on. Um, but was you know what is the process for a student to, or a parent to appeal any any discipline uh, scenarios? And uh, Tim and I were talking about, gosh, have have we had that happen? Uh, and I I don't know that we have. We've had, certainly had discussions with parents, and and things are an open discussion. You know, it's um, I, again we try to establish the relationship that we're looking out in the best interest of your child, and this is what we're seeing. Um, I don't think maybe but once have I ever had a really confrontational conversation with a parent. It has happened once. Um, but it's usually in agreement of what's in the best interest for your child. And you know, as long as we're all on that same page, I, I think we're going to be doing all right. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we've had the situation that we've actually said, oh, no, you're right. We do try to investigate pretty thoroughly. Uh, so before we just, you know, there's the teacher's perspective or the adult's perspective, there's the student's perspective, but there's also about, you know, 100 other eyes that probably saw this one thing. And so we'll try to be pretty thorough in, in making sure we really pin down exactly what it is so, so that we know and then and do a, uh, a fair job of communicating that to the parents um, before we really talk about what, you know, kind of discipline situations there are. Um, but we, we don't have a set appeal process um, at, at the middle school currently. Um, gosh, we're getting crowded over here, but the, ne the next question we were really talking about was what is the school resource officer's uh, role in discipline at, uh, at Fort Smith Middle School? And So for the most part, um, these guys handle pretty much everything. Um, I have had two incidents, and both of them were actually outside of the school that I've done diversions for this year. Other than that, I haven't brought anything to court whatsoever this year. Um, nothing has raised to the level where I would step in. And again, the two incidents that I had diversions with, which is what we normally go to first, is a type of diversion thing to divert things from having to go to court. Um, those, Both of those incidents were things that happened outside of the school day. So for the most part uh, my job there is uh, just to support these guys and provide security as well as make relationships with uh, the kids and provide also like Phil was talking about um, somebody in the building that they can feel comfortable with coming down and, and um, just today uh, I had a couple hanging out in the office that uh, were really struggling today so they that was what I provide I kind of provide a support role to these guys and I think that's the important thing. I, I have students almost on a daily basis get mad at me if I'm not in my office when they need to find me. Um, 
Mr. Hodgson has even more that are, see, and he's harder to find than I am because he's more often all out and around, that are looking for him to, to find him. They're his, he's the go-to person for those people. Uh, Detective Munson has students that are seeking him out. And it's, it's not in an avoidance way. And I should say our school counselors equally have students that are, are seeking them out. It's, it's kind of what we've coached them to do. It's say, hey, it's all right. You're having a bad day. I get it. <laughs> Let's not mouth off or do this or that. If you need to talk, come find me. We'll talk it out. And I don't know, it happened to me twice today. I, I'm sure I know what happened to you today. <laughs> it happens to Tim <clears throat> constantly, excuse me, every day. So again, it's, it's the relationships and building that place. It's not, you know, having been once in the classroom as a teacher, it, it's great to have those relationships. But, you know, when I was teaching social studies, I couldn't have a student come and just and talk to me in the middle of class. There aren't as many opportunities, so you get to have those, those school counselors. Uh, we now have a social worker who's working uh, wonderfully in the system and, and with a lot of different families. The school resource officer, you know, it's not that he's there for discipline. He's there for relationships, and every weekend uh, on Monday we check in just to say, hey, anything happened in the community that we need to know about? And in about half the weekends, there is something in the, that affected a family in the community that we didn't need to know about. Um, so again, that, that communication and, and working, I don't know, as, as a team, not every student, surprise, wants to talk to me. <laughs> a lot of them are really nervous to talk to me, but those ones that I've made a connection with do. And, and same with these guys. We'd rather have them, uh, we'd, we'd rather catch students that way. You know, and I'll say the, the students that I'm the go-to person for, they have been in trouble before, you know, but this is their way out, that they can come and find that uh, ahead of time. Um, so another one of the questions is, um, you know, what what isn't working well and why? Um, and I think it's, it's sometimes that very same thing that doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, for a teacher who's frustrated that uh, a student didn't show up to class um, and to find out that, oh, they've been hanging out with, uh, with this guy or this guy or this guy or a guidance counselor, that's really frustrating because, well, of course, my math class is the most important thing at this time. And, and if I could lift the veil to the teachers of what we were talking about and in the, in the depths of the situation they're in, then they too would know, but, but that's some confidential discussion sometimes and so we don't go into that we say look they needed to be out of class and for the most part we have a trust in that that the teachers are like okay you're saying it's legit it, it's legit and then we start thinking about okay when is the student going to make up their work how are they going to keep on track academically and stuff but uh, I like to use the, f the phrase and it's not my own but uh, the student can't learn when the hair is on fire right they when their world is blown up they could sit there in class, but they're doing everything at that moment except for learning mm -hmm. math or science or social studies. They've got a lot of other things going on, and they're going to pop if they don't get out and talk to somebody. Um, so that that's actually one of the, the issues that we have is, is that maybe we, uh, and I know the high school sees this, and, and um, I don't want to say complains about it, but it's a struggle to transition students from, uh, I'll say, uh, our coddling, if you will, to uh, the realities of the high school. And so that's, that's something that we could do better is uh, bridging that gap and getting students ready for that, uh, for that you know, different environment. And I, and I don't say that as a slam of the high school. I, I say that as a, uh, a unique thing that, that perhaps we're doing um, and maybe embracing kids a little too much sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure, Tim, if you had something else to throw in at that point. Yeah, I'll throw in, uh, so one of the other questions was, uh, you know, what do we do with uh, uh, prevent kids from who are repeat offenders? And uh, uh, those are the ones that I enjoy the most because those are the, because you, you get a real opportunity to kind of bring everybody in. You get to bring the parents in, you bring in the parents, the teachers, and you get to kind of build a, a plan uh, around these kids to allow them to access their education. One of our uh, big beliefs over at uh, PMS is uh, not every single kid fits in the same box. And it's our job as educators in the community to 
design a new box. Uh, so we have a variety of different kids who have a bunch of different plans, uh, and uh, you know what? It can be something as simple uh, from an attendance-based one. If you, uh, I can tell you uh, that uh, how much a, a grande uh, caramel coffee at Starbucks and a cake pop is. It's nine forty-four because uh, uh, a kid can go if they go five days, they get one of those. Uh, you know, Phil's got Phil, Phil's got deals for kids who don't like to uh, uh, ride the bus home if they make it to all their classes and execute their, throughout their day. He'll shoot them home. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of our staff that do a lot of things, um, kind of incentivizing kids to to make it through their day. Um, at the same time, we do a lot of you know movement breaks uh, if uh, if kids need it, and uh, those are really kind of invaluable for uh, for some of our kids who are struggling to maintain in the uh, the classroom setting. Uh, one of the cool things now is we now have a, a little workout area, so you know, bringing a kid down there and having them do a, uh, a challenge meet to a set of pull-ups uh, is uh, is a good way to kind of break up the uh, break up the day. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Munson will bring them down. Yeah, <laughs> I put do on the gloves. I have some boxing gloves too that on occasion <laughs> the kids like to, to box around. Uh, but those are all things that you know, it, it, those repeat offenders is uh, is really where we shine the most, and it's putting together those plans and and meeting those kids uh, kind of where they're at and you know and as you go through our data when you look at the number of people that we have suspended this year uh, of our number of kids that we've suspended we've only suspended two two different kids multiple times uh, and I think that's a testament that that process really works and that putting that that box and redesign that box is a real strength of our uh, of our building I think it's the understanding that everyone's gonna mess up I mean you think about your own middle school years I know my middle school years I made plenty of, plenty of mistakes and so and, and also framing that for parents that is going to happen and that's okay that's normal that's regular that's human development um, but how do we react when that happens and how do we re-educate so it, you only have two repeat offenders you only have two students who have been suspended more than once this year that's pretty incredible and I was an angel in middle school, so I don't know what he was talking about. <laughs> the thing I had was really bad hair. So. All right, shall we open it up to questions and comments by board members? Does anybody have a question or a comment? Who wants to start? Oh, Carrie. I have a lot of questions and comments, but I'm going to stick to one for now. Um, so um, I just, I really appreciate the approach. Um, I'm, uh, I joined the school board saying I had no, no issues, I had no platform, but this having come up is like really near and dear to me. Um, so I'm a college professor, I'm a nurse, my research is on needle exchange, harm reduction, people who use drugs. Um, and so I want students to have all those skills. Um, I find it, and, and so part of in the realm that I'm in and my work with clients and things like that is this feeling that, well, one, from a college professor level, this piece of like coddled in middle school, strict, strict in high school, and I'm a coddler. Like most of the faculty <laughs> I work with are coddlers. It's like, it's like things have changed in the overall educational world. Like I want first gen college students to graduate with honors. I want, you know what I mean? Like, I think it's just changed, right? So I'm, I'm a little leery about the, like we don't coddle people because I think those skills, reaching out to people is really important. And then on like a clinical level and working with drug diversion programs and police and things like that, I almost feel like those have progressed so much over the last 10 years. Like you talk about the incidents that go to diversion, but like our school policies have like stayed stagnant. And I'm just curious, like um, Detective Munson or any of you, like if there's lessons learned in that process where we've realized just arresting everyone, you know, punish, punish, punish is not the approach how we extend that into kind of our overall school system, because we have to have an approach and a policy for all levels, even though it's gonna be a little nuanced. Yeah, so I will say the one, cut you off, she did ask you, but I'll cut off. One thing uh, that, I, that I've struggled with is, is I was assistant principal and, and now as principal is the sometimes public display of what happened right so a student did something in a very large public way and for them just to come down to the office have a chat put them back together and say it's okay well that's not really okay because there was that public display piece of it right there was that that disruption of learning for the other 
22 students in that class uh, for the teacher uh, for you, whatever the situation was. And so there, there does need to be an understanding. And we never come out and broadcast and say, Timmy was suspended for three days for that action. You know, <laughs> sorry, Tim, no offense. Uh, we, we don't ever announce, like you know, what it was. There. But at the same time, students obviously are very aware and they <laughs> believe it or not uh, rumor mills start uh, and so there is kind of that awareness so there there do need to be real Actual. consequences um, to discourage future behaviors you know so if oh gosh if, if this student got away with it well then maybe that's not a bad idea maybe I, had to, I ought to try that too um, it's not it doesn't speak exactly to what you're talking about but um, you know it's so, I mean, my experience before Ports Middle School, I worked in a, a couple districts that uh, uh, behaviorally were a lot more challenging. Um, this is in the heart of the, the opioid crisis and uh, dealt with uh, schools that had a, a significant amount of physical uh, violence, uh, significant amount of drug use, uh, and uh, I will had a, a number of people going through the juvenile justice system uh, as probably one of the, you know, Phil has been doing it uh, and Rob's been doing it a long time. Uh, I hear you when you say that, you know, because a lot of the kids that we put through that juvenile justice program and, and in some of my old schools, you know, we would even go as far as charging kids for fights inside the schools. Um, you know, the success rate of those were, you know, when you look at repeat offenders, that was pretty common. Um, and, you know, it's been really great working with uh, with Rob because, uh, you know, he gets that and, and does a really nice job, even if he hears like a, a rumor of something, he's really good about pulling a kid down and just saying like, hey, before you get into a fight outside of school and, and here's what could happen, let's let's talk this thing through. And you know, it's oftentimes he's grabbing one kid and I'm hearing the rumor about the other kid and you know, we're meeting in the hallway going like, hey, did you hear this? Uh, and I just talked to the kids. So, you know, the, the juvenile justice you know, system that we're in and I'm the court liaison for the, uh, the school, um, you know, and it, it, it's got its pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. And, and from the court's perspective, they want to encourage the school to have first crack at things. So um, I'm in the loop with what's going on, um, but the school usually has first crack at things. So we've been lucky this, this year that um, in any incident that we had that was kind of on my radar, um, we didn't have repeat offenders. Um, and just like like Tim was saying, just today we had a couple, We there was a little bit of a, a stir about it with a couple of our boys and we were able to break that up before it actually turned into a fight. So we try to be pre preemptive if we can. Um, and it's usually, we usually catch wind of things as, as things are going down. The, the kids feel comfortable enough with bringing things to our attention. So in that in that regard, we try to we try to. The next step for us would be diversion, where I enter an, into a contract with the parents and the um, student, and we would uh, set a, a series of goals. And I've been very fortunate. Like I said, the two that I've got active right now no issues and usually for the most part every diversion that I've had has gone very well um, but they enter into that contract knowing full and well that if they violate what the guidelines that we've set it's going to end up going to court um, that's the next step but it, especially at this stage we're geared more towards um, a support role um, and uh, a role to build relationships with kids. So I kind of, um, I know what's going on, but I've kind of hands on unless, you know, something's going on and I can kind of interact a little bit with them. And our age group is really, they talk all the time, which makes our job a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, they're so bad at social media, which again, uh, <laughs> and makes our job uh, really easy because it's oftentimes it's like, play. Uh, so. And, and even in my office, the police officer's office, they, uh, I am amazed at some of the things that they open up and talk about, so, mm -hmm. which is really good. Mago. Um, thank you, very helpful. Can you talk a little bit more about the, um, I guess the touch points on how you're communicating out behavior expectations? Like, as you said, it is age appropriate and it's a little different of expectations in elementary versus middle, so how do you, how do you set the tone? How often do you revisit it? How do you check in to see that it's, 
being understood? Because it, it, it does, communication is so critical. I'd just be curious to hear that those strategies. Yeah, sure. So um, our our handbook, I review it every summer, um, and you know it's printed in the, the student agenda book. At the beginning of the year, we meet uh, by team, which is 80 to 90 students, um, and the three of us will actually be there and go through kind of a slideshow of the, the major expectations, uh, open it up for questions, make sure they have it, uh, kind of the large picture understanding of, of what the expectations are. Oftentimes the teachers will then the next day follow up in the success block, which is the, again that small group of about 12 students that's the same as homeroom, but at the end of the day um, to just kind of go over and, and clarify any points, ask for any questions. Um, in, in that that's kind of it at the start and then we address things as they as they may blow up so it's not uncommon at some point uh, during the year uh, COVID being the exception to call together and say okay we're going to talk to the entire quest 8 team and pull them out to the breakout space and just say hey look you guys have been playing this game and it, whatever it is and it's not cool here is the reason why I mean it's happened before we said okay we're we're pulling all seventh grade boys and we're gonna talk to you guys all at once and again it's it's addressing it head-on and just saying this isn't this isn't what happens here and here's why and here's what's gonna happen if it does happen here um, which is you know when you think about the, uh, the what was it called the TikTok. Mm -hmm. Damage to schools. I, they had a more crafty name yeah. than that. Uh, but we did have in one day, um, we had a, a phone taken off the wall in a classroom and, and a mouse taken. Um, so I got on the, the PA system, stated the name of it, whatever that was, uh, and just said, it's not going to happen here. And if it does happen here, you are going to be responsible for the full cost of replacement and the police are going to be involved. It didn't happen again. And now, you know, would it have come down that hard and fast on a kid? Probably not. Uh, but did they need to understand that this isn't going to happen at Portsmouth Middle School? Yeah, because schools were being destroyed. Uh, and this was just the tip of it. It was right away. It was immediate. It was timely. And just, we're not going to do it. And I don't think we had a single other incident after that, that day. So, again, it's just that. I guess quick decision points and, and yeah. jump around some things. Thank you. Hmm? Anyone else? Liz. Um, I have a little small handful of questions, so I'll try to be um, uh, to the point. Um, I, I was hoping uh, uh, Officer Munson could sort of expand on diversion, um, what kinds of things sort of end up in diversion. I mean, obviously, you've only had two. Um, and. What, the, what does diversion entail? I know you had talked about a contract and um, uh, that they set goals, but um, does that, are those things like community service? Are they like, so I guess I just was hoping that you could sort of expand on um, what um, diversion is and how that entails specifically. Sure, so um, basically we are diverting some type of criminal act from going to juvenile court. So I will meet with the parents and they have input on it as well as I have input. Uh, usually there is some community service aspect to it, um, which uh, I have a lot, I do a lot with Special Olympics and some other things, so I try to encourage them to help out with that. Um, so that's an aspect of it. And usually I try to do about, you know, with the ones that I have right now, I try to get us through the school year, if not the summer, of being of good behavior at school and at home. Um, the parents may say, well, I would like them to have good grades, so we may put that in there. But they, they have input and say so on what goes into that contract. Can you expand, though, is there any sort of, like, discipline, so to speak, like, um, you have to sit out or you have to you can't do this or um, like uh, we want you to join a sport or we want you to do this or I mean if, I if, to get into sure if if things. the parents would want that I don't normally put that into my contract but if the parents are like well I want them to attend such and such on the weekends we can put that in there okay. so we work with the parents in conjunction to set the guidelines for those contracts and they have, again they have say so the, I, I, I flat out tell uh, the young individual that they really don't have much say so in it. Um, but uh, 
so but again we work with the family to you know they and they have put stuff like that in the past and some of the ones that i used to do in the high school the parents would say hey i want um them to attend counseling or whatever it is and they would have to attend those counseling sessions in in regards to more of the middle school level it's pretty much it, let's just um make sure this doesn't happen again um you know one was one one of the two that i have was a fight uh you know i i put in there no contact between the um that individual and, and the other individual that the fight was with and um you know again haven't had any problems with that uh, you know and what's good is we build these relationships with these kids that um i can constantly check in with that young individual and make sure you know they're doing good and encourage when they do do good things like i think we had an incident regarding one of the contracts where um the individual did very well and avoided a potential um interaction and phil and i when we saw him come, when we saw that individual come in that morning we praised them for what they had done so we try to you know encourage that stuff and why is there so few is there so few because things have to rise to a certain level in order to i mean so there has to be some sort of element that would actually go to court but then you're not going to court so i guess i'm wondering why there's so few is it because things don't rise to that level or things maybe rise beyond that level and you're not there yeah so so it would have to rise to a serious enough security uh, issue um, or be like a repeat offender type thing if we caught somebody um, vaping a couple of times that may rise to the level where I need to step in but most of the time we're able to um, the school's able to handle that on the first level I'm involved and in, I you know I, especially if I know the individual that, that's involved I can have a conversation with them and um, but for the most part the school gets first crack it's either got to be a serious um, safety issue or it's got to be like a repeat offender type thing. Okay. And then um, can you talk more about so, uh, so just a couple more questions I had. I don't want to take up too much time. I, um, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to know more about the confidentiality piece because there's this interesting interplay and it sort of was brought to our attention last time that there is this um, RO sign between the police department and the schools and it gives you guys a good talk you know a good point to be able to sort of check in in case like maybe a parent was arrested over the weekend and so to know if that there's sort of this trauma going on at home but but then but then you said that the kids sort of come talk to you and then you can't tell the teachers what's going on. So I guess I'm just wondering if you could sort of talk to that confidentiality piece because I think that that's something that maybe the school board will need to wrestle with at some point. Um, uh, within maybe it's more relevant at the high school where things are sort of broadcasted where you're saying like hey you're you know, you're, not, you're saying hey you're suspended but um, we want to make set an example of the situation. Um, so I guess I just am wondering what your thoughts are on this confidentiality situation. Sure. So the, the confidentiality that I'm speaking of is, you know, the, the progression through the school as you go from uh, maybe paraprofessional to teacher to uh, assistant principal and principal or even guidance counselor somewhere in there, school counselor in there, um, the veil is lifted, right? I, I will sometimes tell students, even though I haven't spoken to them directly about their home life and their situation or what happened to them in third grade when we get down to it i say look i i understand and i know the story and we don't have to talk about that but i i do know that because i'm i'm privy to that information that's the information that you know their math teacher doesn't need to know and so that's the confidentiality that i'm talking about i, I don't need to go and say oh well this you know god awful story happened early in this child's life i can say this is a trauma student and they've had some things happen and so you know and it maybe even say these are some events or things topics that might trigger this student um, but that's the confidentiality confidentiality that I'm speaking of um, is kind of the home life past experience type things um, and yes there is a confidentiality when you're talking about specific disciplinary measures I, I don't have the right to discuss any student's specific disciplinary measures with anyone but that child and their parent. Um, you know, if there's ever, say, a fight, the student wants to say, well, 
what happened to him? You know, is he also going to be suspended? Well, that's not what's important right now. What you need to know what what your piece of it is, and that's where it ends is between you, me, and your parents at that at that time, not everybody else because well of course everybody wants to know everybody else's business they're middle schoolers um but that's kind of what i'm sorry i'm not sure if that fully addresses yeah, I guess I just, from a policy standpoint obviously there's FERPA, but i feel like there's other things that would fall like outside of FERPA that you know wouldn't be disciplined like you know, the student maybe coming to chit chat with you about something at home or whatever and and so i guess i was uh, when i was reading through some of these policies i was kind of just trying to wrap my head around you know what what do we have in policy and then what is actually able to just sort of do and, and whether you're sort of just taking that stance like I, I understand that like a social worker has a certain level of confidentiality that maybe another school employee wouldn't have to a student um, in sharing information just because of that their role as a social worker but I don't know that that's necessarily in a policy other than um, our FERPA policy um, regarding like discipline in, in school records and stuff. So I think that's something that I've been trying to wrap my head around a little bit and I think it's obviously, I think it's a national, you know, I don't know if it came into some of these, um, uh, the, some of the stuff that's in the house right now about um, student records and whatnot and sharing of information. And so just sort of, you know, as far as discipline and, and communication with students, I was trying to understand that. And I'll pass it on. The only other question I had and was hoping that you'd expand on was, um, social media and bullying and whatnot because I think that's something that happens outside of school that probably comes more to school and middle I imagine middle schoolers are probably heavily using social media in ways that you know uh, they're saying a lot and doing a lot and I've seen some uh, middle school social media Instagrams of uh, things that may not have been appropriate before so um, I guess I'm just wondering like how does that end up coming into the school day and um, and I think because we have a social media policy I believe or a um, bullying policy and so I guess I'm wondering you know I don't obviously once we look at that we might want to go into that a little bit more and social media and whatnot and so I'm just wondering if you can expand on your experience with uh, social media and bullying. <laughs> Tim's our house expert. So, okay. <laughs> so when, again, when you're looking at bullying, you're looking at the displacement of power. So that's one of the things that you know we we use the term bullying often. Uh, and if I tell uh, uh, Robbie stinks, and then he says you stink more, I can't then claim you're bullying me. I mean that. So what you're looking for is you're looking for that displacement of power in every case. So um, bullying and that, those social media violations are two different things. Uh, we're constantly getting, uh, unfortunately, because uh, all our parents gave their kids cell phones, uh, we're constantly getting hammered with uh, uh, social media stuff because our kids, unfortunately, they make mistakes on social media. And, and we're pretty proactive in contacting parents, uh, even outside of uh, school hours. Uh, the three of us are always um, monitoring and kind of going back and forth. Uh, uh, at all hours of the uh, the day. Uh, I mean, it was uh, uh, Christmas Eve this year, and I was on the phone with a parent about something that was on there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the job, I think, uh, our job has kind of turned into a 365 day uh, a year job with that uh, because we tend to be a lot of that that negative stuff kind of goes through the school um, you know we're pretty open about if we see something uh, and something gets reported to us which happens all the time because kids talk um, you know we're pretty pretty great about uh, contacting parents uh, and just saying hey here's the screenshot and this is what your kids doing uh, take your uh, take your kid off uh, social media take their device and you you know, we'll touch base with them the next time we're in person. Um, you know, those conversations happen a lot. Um, you know, our parents, I'll say in the community, are, are really great when a, it's not a pleasant phone call to hear my voice at 9.30 at night on a Friday. Um, and uh, our parents uh, that uh, I would say that we work with are really great about listening and saying, hey, this is what your kid's doing, here's the screenshots. I don't have all the details, but I need you to, to intervene until we can touch base with the kid on, on Monday when they're in person. Um, and, and oftentimes, it's it, the, the issue stops right then and there. So, and that's really helpful for us to kind of work together in those regards. But it, it does sometimes bleed into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday too, and that's when we have the right to, to intervene because it's affecting the other students' learning day. It's affecting their school day because of what was said over the weekend, and it's a it's a pull your hair out scenario for us because it, it means that the school day never really ends. It, it means our job does not just have the boundaries of 
the the wall, the brick walls of Portsmouth Middle School, it goes beyond. And things that, of course, things that happen on social media bleed right into the school day. And so again, it's that upfront trying to get on top of it, and then again, explaining this happened. It's going to stop right now. This is the end of it. Uh, otherwise, we are in this situation, and maybe it is bullying, maybe it is harassment. Um, and if and if it doesn't, then that's when you go down those paths. I think Lisa had a question, and then Ian and Pip. I feel like there's been so many questions. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing, big picture, I was curious to get your perspective on is there's a few things I very clearly have not heard you say in what you're talking about. I haven't heard you say that you remove kids from sports, or that you take kids out of clubs, or that they're you know removed from any extracurriculars. Is that something that doesn't happen in your approach to discipline, or did you just not? share with us that piece of it so we'll use we'll use sports as a, as a carrot uh, mm -hmm. sometimes for some of our kids who are repeat offenders like I'm just thinking uh, this week we had a, a kid that was kind of struggling and played on our baseball team and feels like look hey I need you in class and I need you engaged from here on out because you have a game tonight and I don't want that to, to impact it um, and because he didn't want the, to send the kid home and obviously if you send him home he can't play so to which he said don't take away baseball <laughs> and went to class. <laughs> went to class and did a thing. So, so that's, you know, we, we do work uh, a lot with our, uh, our kids and our student athletes to, you know, maintain uh, good behavior. It's not a perfect uh, uh, system because sometimes, you know, we, you know, there's, there's, a, there's occasion that we'll be like, ah, should we be, should this kid be playing or not playing? Um, it's something I think with our new athletic director coming on that this will be a conversation, you know, that we'll be having with, uh, with cause um, and talking a little bit about, hey, you know, how can we do this better? Because I think, you know, there are some, some ways and some, some ways that we can kind of tighten that up and still have some flexibility that, that we enjoy. So I want to just follow up on that because I think one thing we're wrestling with as a board big picture is if we want to think about discipline K-12, so we teach them the right things in kindergarten so then they come to you ready for your expectations and then you send them to the high school ready for those expectations. Does it feel consistent to you? And if it doesn't, you know, what do we do? Because I feel like as a board, we're not trying to tell you how to run the school, but we're trying to create policies that put a good structure in place that's consistent K-12, and I don't feel like when we're talking about it right now that that's what we're hearing from people. And it it's, could be our yeah, fault, like it, we wrote terrible policies, or you, it could well, be... You, <laughs> you have a better view of it than, than we do, it, you know, right. in the middle. We know what we do with the students that we have. Um, I wouldn't say that I have a, a great view or opinion of what happens at elementary schools. Right. Um, and I know, you know, some students that we send to Portsmouth High School, we hear stories, but not to say we forget about them when they leave, but, but we're, we're busy with the students in front of us on a day-to-day, -day. and so I, I don't know that I would say um, it's consistent or inconsistent. I would imagine there are some inconsistencies um, as you go K-12, for sure. And I would say, you know, getting the, the operational administrators uh, and all the buildings together and having a conversation about discipline I think is something that would be uh, valuable uh, you know um, I, I think you know oftentimes and this is just the unfortunate thing of education you end up working in a silo and you know to be honest I don't really know much about the other buildings I can barely find Dondero when I drive there um, <laughs> so I get lost in that neighborhood every time um, it's like one time um, but uh, <laughs> You guys can fix that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it is something that I think, you know, we've talked as an admin team of, of trying to find more time. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's one of the unfortunate things is, you know, we finding those, those moments and finding that time to all get together is, is a real challenge for us. But it would be really valuable. And I, and I think we've, we've talked about that in our PLCs often. Fair enough. And I just wondered whether or not uh, there was uh, one grade or another that had more more incidents. <clears throat> I know you mentioned the, the the honeymoon at the beginning of sixth grade, but I didn't know whether uh, six, it, seven, or eight was. There's not one grade that does is is worse than the other. I mean, we'll have little, uh, you know, again, depending on the every every couple of years we, we tend to have a, a class that tends to be a little bit more than, than others um, but for the most part it's it's pretty pretty consistent you know it's not like I sit there and go 
oh man, here comes the, the eighth graders or here come the seventh graders. Um, for the most part, they're all a little different, but they're, again, we have really good kids and the majority of them make the right decisions. And, and that's really, uh, uh, really helps us and makes our job easy in that regard. And have they worked back after, I remember Phil, when you came to the board meeting one time saying that, that the, uh, the eighth graders were acting like sixth graders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the sixth grade teachers are saying, well, now you know what we deal with all the time. <laughs> and has that changed back to what it was pre? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I would say probably mid-November to December, uh, students were better socially integrated, if you will, uh, into the school. There's still sometimes regressive behaviors, you know, and you still think, wow, that's not quite the way I remember other classes of eighth graders, seventh graders, sixth graders uh, behaving, interacting socially, but the figuring out how to behave within a school building when there's so many other people around, uh, that's, that has smoothed out a great deal. Right. We've seen a lot of growth with our, our kids uh, this year. Uh, and again, you look at our, eight, our eighth graders, our eighth grade classes is like their first really normal year They're that they've here, had. Yeah. So the growth that they've had, you know, our seventh graders have really grown. Are they where they would traditionally be? I would say, I would say probably not, but we've seen a lot of growth when they are catching up and figuring out how to act it's like students. And again, that's not us, that's our staff that are doing yeah. the, the bulk of that work. We're just, we're just there. Great, probably well, glad you are. Pip. Thanks. Um, I have two questions for you, but um, I also want to say that I'm, I very much appreciate your efforts to sort of preempt issues before they happen, I think, by building the trust and relationships. I think that seems to work really well, and um, I'm just glad for the students that they have that. Um, one question is, do you do you ever get into a situation where you're disciplining kids for things that happen outside of school, or do you only have do you only work with them on issues that occur in school? I think the only issues that we discipline for that happen outside of school are those social media mm. bullying type or or. Um, mean behaviors that happen and then that's an intervention that we have immediately on Monday or Tuesday whenever you know they're in school next mm -hmm. um, but no if if something has happened outside of school that would be you know illegal we catch wind of it we'll let this guy know um, at which he'll then reach out to parents and see if there's you know a, a way forward or if they, if they wants to be reported. Mm -hmm. um, but no, that that actually has been a really tricky point of being having the Connie Bean Center right there, is mm -hmm. because that is technically not the school mm -hmm. at 315, mm -hmm. but a lot of stuff happens there every day, and so to constantly drawing those lines, and of course who controls the cameras that can see what happened there? It's the the three of us, yeah. um, and so uh, we've had some actually great conversations with Todd Henley. Um, about how we can move forward and, and maybe restructure things over there with the opening of community campus and, and better supervision. But that's a different discussion. Um, so yeah, not we don't typically get involved with, with things that happen outside unless they're of a dangerous nature. Obviously, you know something that's going to put somebody in danger at risk, and and we'll intervene. Yeah. Okay. I do, but uh, a lot of times I'll take those things because I know the families and I know the, the kids involved anyway, so it's easy for me to kind of make that transition to work through that. So I, so I will, like I was saying earlier, the two diversion issues that I have right now were outside. Um, they were from incidents that happened outside of the school. But they don't then have consequences at school? No, 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 no. Okay. yeah. Um, so, and then my other question was, um, are there any restorative elements that you use in your discipline? Bless you. God bless you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think there's, uh, there's not a restorative justice program, say, um, but there are, there are certainly elements um, that exist, whether it's building up the, you know, 
rewarding positive behavior, whether it's, um, there are sometimes instances of, hey, you wronged this in this way, so now we are going to work back uh, and do uh, some, you know, you're gonna rake leaves in front of the school or come out and pick up trash in front of the, you know, those, those types of things. Um, I have worked in a school in the past that had, you know, real programs around that, and, and we don't. Okay. And I would say we probably lean more towards the restorative side than the punitive side. Uh, you know, and I've, I've run both systems uh, in my career. Um, and, and again, a lot of it, a lot of what we do at Ports Middle School is uh, relationships and communication, which I think probably leans more towards that restorative side and, and that individualized plan with the, the kids to make sure that we're not seeing repeated behaviors. Yeah, and I will just note that uh, something I want us to keep in mind when we're talking about the policy is that it seems like the individualized approach really works well. Um, and so I want to be cognizant that we're not creating a policy that limits you from being able to make right. individualized choices and, and determine I, I, I think very similarly on that, because you get policy black and white that hamstrings the ability to work with an individual sometime on the exact situation that happened that's very nuanced and, you know. Okay, um, Hope, yeah, so, and then we'll do Carrie and I have a few <coughs> questions too, and hopefully then we can sum this all up. So I have a <laughs> handful of questions, but I, I just wanted to validate a few things that I heard you guys say first, um, because Phil, I heard you say like, it is important to have room for different disciplinary approaches in different buildings, you know, as far as policy goes, there might need to be modifications, but one of the things that I noted, because I think there, there can be systems put in place that can draw across buildings, and I think what I've heard from you guys is communications with parents and staff proactively, relationships, you've only said that word probably at least 30 <laughs> times, I've been taking account, <laughs> with kids, proactive in educating kids and making a plan with students for a go-to person before they need that go-to person positive discipline and also very clear boundaries which you've repeated multiple times and I think those things are all all components that could work in any building and I think not to say that that's not happening in our district but I do think there's some inconsistency so I, I, I would just ask that we take note as as a board on those things um, and think about that as we're framing systems f to go out to the community. It's almost more of a philosophy than it is policy. Exactly, yes. Um, and so in, in the spirit of that, um, some of the questions that I had for you <coughs> is um, in the relationships you have with kids, I'm wondering, do you find yourself really building those proactively across the, the entire school, or do you find that you're really building up relationships with the kids that are coming in for disciplinary problems? Because I know that's a struggle at the high school, and I know that there's also been times that, you know, we've talked about, well, the high school's bigger, but there's also more staff, so, you know, we could probably revamp some things in, in every building, but I'm just curious where you see those relationship yeah, building. We've pushed, things falling. Um, we've, we've pushed folks to the homeroom, that's what, what it's there for, to notice and uh, connect with students. Success block at the end of the day, same student, same teacher, that's what it's there for. Um, not everybody fits into that mold. So the relationships that, that the three of us have, uh, or particularly maybe uh, Tim and I have, are sometimes more behavioral situational and, and have built up over sometimes three years to really have that go-to person. Um, so it would be fantastic if, if I could have more of those relationships with students. It's, it's not really possible in my day. Um, but so it, it sometimes is, are those students who need that, that need that, that go-to person outside of the system that's already been created. Okay. And, um, and then I'm curious also, uh, you talked about the cuddling, the coddling at PMS. Um, I, I would agree with you there that having three kids that have struggled going from PMS to PHS, I, th I think there's some give and take that could happen both ways mm -hmm. there in just my observation. A little less coddling, a little more preparation for the reality of high school, but 
but again, it goes back to those relationships. I don't think it's just the coddling that gets. I think it's the relationships that are, mm-hmm. you know, that get lost going up to the high school. So I just made note of that. Um, but I'm curious around policy. In listening to a lot of the high school presenters in our last workshop, it really occurred to me that I think we have written some policies that have tied the hands from procedural execution. And I think as a board member, I have to be really thoughtful about, you know, it's kind of like working at headquarters and then sending down something, having no idea how it plays out for the soldiers or going to play out in the operation room. I'm just curious what you guys have seen in your standpoint around are there times you've bumped up against policy that you feel like, geez, I wish this was looked at differently or the approach was differently. How do you feel our school policies play out right now in procedural execution for you? you know, I think the the more serious offenses are when, honestly, when we take a deep look at what is the board policy on a weapons violation, on a drug or alcohol violation, um, on, on some of those serious matters that, that consistency is paramount, right? We, we're not going to say, oh, well, this kid was treated this way and did this, the same offense as this kid. So um, it's, it's those more serious ones that you rely on board policy, on what exactly is written in that handbook, um, and, and the letter of the law. Um, it's, you know, it just makes a lot more sense to be consistent and fair, and this is what you get. Have we run in the face of that, not that I can, not that I can necessarily recall. Um, those are kind of those are the set operational procedures, and that's the way we're going to do it uh, when it comes to those things. We have. You, I'm sorry. Can, yeah. can you just say what those were? You said those are weapons, drugs, and alcohol. Okay. We um, haven't had. I mean, we haven't had uh, possession of drugs on our campus in three years. Weapons, none. And I mean, I have to fill out a survey at the end of every year, and it, uh, in my old districts, it used to be a lot of a uh, lot of data, and uh, in Portsmouth, it's a lot of zeros. Um, about good. you know, we just we just don't have those issues. I mean, we've never had alcohol in our building uh, that you know of. That we know of. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, things. Uh, I'm I'm not naive. I'm sure things yeah. things happen. There's drugs but, in your building. But yeah. what you we know? just don't have those those situations. Uh, so just last question. Um, I, I'm i curious, you mentioned about the counselors and social workers, you know, and I know that that's on our agenda, on our budget for more at the middle school. Can you just talk a little bit about their role and when they come in and how you use them um, to kind of support if it is disciplinary or otherwise, um, yeah. it, especially in plans? The counselors aren't used a whole lot in, in disciplinary measures. Um, maybe as a, if there's someone that's got a close relationship and they've they've run you know run aground and, and or bumped up against uh, some trouble, then we may call a school counselor in to be that person of support uh, while we're you know talking our way through a situation. Um, they are more the social emotional go-to folks um, for students and so they will work with individuals um, really heavily with individuals uh, who are going through you name it um, and teachers and students know that they can come to uh, school counselors for any variety of reasons that we've got an online format that students all are aware of that they can <coughs> alert that hey I need to talk to one of you, they could also just drop in. But you know, this, sometimes it's difficult to ask a teacher, say, "Hey, can I go speak to Mr. Beeman or whomever?" Uh, so they can they can do that online, uh, and then rate a severity of you know what what is the weight of what I really need to speak to you about, and that'll kind of drive the immediacy of that attention. Um, but we we don't typically involve you know in a, in a run of the mill uh, behavior situation. We will bring those behaviors back in the team meeting, and the school counselors are in those team meetings too. So that um, to say, you know, this person was out, or this person's really struggling right now with that person. So let's just keep an eye on this and keep them away, or or help them guide through. And so, 
last question. Oh, and I'll, I'll just do a quick plug for our social worker, because uh, having that position has been a tremendous help for me personally. Uh, one of the things that was really unique about my position before uh, uh, Lisa came on was I was constantly getting pulled out to the community um, to handle a, a wide variety of things that I'm never taken a class in. Um, and having Lisa and having a social worker there and just having somebody who I can bring into a house and knows the resources, is trained. And I mean, it's been a huge help to me um, just because that tends to kind of fall under on my shoulders. It's, it's really freed me up about, you know what, this kid needs glasses and what we, all of a sudden I'm focused on that for two hours. She can take it and run and just be like, hey, glasses are ready, go pick them up. It's like th those instances, it's just been a, a huge asset uh, to our building and to our kids. That's super helpful to know as we advocate for that social worker position for you guys. <laughs> um, last question, because I want to pass it on to whoever's next, um, is I'm, I'm just curious around, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. What were we talking about before you mentioned? I just totally lost my school worker though. position. Uh -huh. School workers, oh uh, yeah, You're, counselors. Yeah, the um, just go ahead. It'll pop back up to me. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. just, um, I, yeah, and I had seven questions. I'm down to two, so <laughs> everyone answered all of them. Um, and I think just uh, just in hearing what you're saying, I just appreciate so much your approach. And I and I think part of what the board and my view is struggling with is that. Um, that individualization and there's a hard balance that we have to set with a policy in enabling that to happen um, but then on the converse side if I come in I'm the new principal and I say every time an eighth grader drinks they're gonna become an alcoholic they're out of school for a month like I know that's you know what I mean like so it's like this hard I'm, I'm making up that's not gonna happen um, you know but like <laughs> I saw a concerned look, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's just this piece of when individualization um, is in disagreement from the parents, from prior, you know, punishments for other students. So anyway, I think that's part of what we're grappling with. And I think part of what we're hearing is that's a bigger, you know, a, a work group. That's a, that's like a year long discussion on how we do that. Um, and I'd say that's hiring practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, really in. in yeah. I uh, I put a lot of weight on on hiring at the middle school and to get the right people with the right attitudes in, and you know should you be looking for another uh, leadership position in in any of the schools or I think that hiring the right people is paramount right you you want them those, that's part of the vetting process you want them to have the right attitudes so that they're going to fit the culture that is desired by the community. And, and even to play off of that, we have changed our policy with the police department to where we have a process where you have individuals that go through and Phil and I were in on the oral board and it's somebody who wants to be there, uh, somebody who their heart's in the right place and they want to make a difference with kids. So even in that regard, we're on board with that as well. And so I, I think with um, what Liz was talking about and just one of the concerns is so there's one way where you get information and you and your team reach out proactively, hey, how's it going? Do you want to talk when you know that a parent's been arrested over the weekend or whatever happened? But then in, in other circumstances, that communication with the police department is being used by the high school for discipline of its students. And so that's part of that confidentiality. Con and, and so I, I just put it out there for like the context. And, and if you have any suggestions on how to manage that. I, I don't, I, I personally, um, f years we've worked together. So we built that trust to where we could share that information back and forth and, and maintain that confidentiality. Um, I know that if something happens over the weekend, I'll grab Phil or Tim and I will tell them, hey, they, listen, this happened. And that we may not approach that student, but at least we'll have it on 
if they start to there starts to be a crisis type situation we know what's going on and so we don't we may not proactively seek out that student um, but we have that on, on our radar so that if something starts happening we know why that's going on um, so from I can't speak for the high school and I and I know what you're talking about but for us it's more of sharing stuff for the safety and well-being of the children uh, versus um, trying to seek disciplinary action because the stuff that I, that I deal with that's disciplinary action does not it does not impact stuff that we do at the school you know even those the two incidents uh, one was after school at the Connie Bean and one was not anywhere near the school so they they weren't related but mm -hmm. the main thing that I do is I, I share information questions. for right, to we avoid have to those crisis oh, sorry can I Wait. remember my question all right we have to sum this up so okay. and I have questions so okay you go um, first. I, I just remembered my, my question from earlier um, I'm just curious in your time in the district where have you been um, engaged in the policy making before it get, hits the handbook uh, I know we have first and second readings, you know, like have you have you ever been Pardon say me. summoned but invited <laughs> to a policy yeah. committee meeting to review something? I'm just curious like and, and would that be helpful if you haven't been a part or would it be helpful to know what policies are under review when they're actually under review? So I have been a, a piece and part of uh, one of the policies uh, several years ago. Uh, that came into place, um, and I think Steve does on occasion highlight the policies that are under review and seek out kind of the stakeholders that might have the the most input, you know, or the, the most impact. I'd say not, you know, and oftentimes it's not going to be the middle school. Um, so. Okay, that's yeah. helpful to understand. Thanks, I appreciate it, Phil. Can you make a quick yeah, one question? A, I just didn't know if, um, <laughs> if you could expand on uh, uh, to whichever one. Have you has Chins done anything or voluntary services? Like, have you been able to work with mm -hmm. voluntary services? I guess we probably all will laugh at this to some extent, but I don't know if the board knows what Chins is or what voluntary services are, and that um, those are generally implemented um, in maybe more in Rob Munson's world or the JPPO world. Uh, or um, if the division gets involved before um, things sort of escalate, hopefully. So I guess I just wonder if um, if you could sort of just give the board a brief description of what that is and if it's actually being used. And then my other question was, where do you pull best practice from as far as how you guide and, and use brain development? I mean, obviously you've had years of training, but I don't know if you could spit out to the board like some sort of place that you've done trainings with or some sort of um, I don't know if there's a, a, a place that offers, you know, who's like, who is there somebody you look at for uh, how you guys pulled things together or anything? Thanks. So I'll, I'll let Tim speak on the on the Chins piece a lot because I it's not necessarily my world as much as it is his. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, how long do we want to talk? Because I can talk about the juvenile justice system for a long time. Um, yeah. So the the Chin system, you know, we sometimes will um, you know make referrals, um, encourage uh, parents to make referrals on their own their own child's behalf. We work with uh, the JPPOs. Um, that system changes all the time. Uh, it's going over a, a pretty fundamental change uh -huh. right now. Um, I am usually, typically at court, because usually the school gets linked to any any uh, Chins petition. So is that? So I'm the court liaison, so I get linked to a lot of those cases. So usually once or twice a week, I'm over at the court uh, to report on a kid's progress in school. Um, you know, it's a system that needs help. I think even you talk to the people that who work in there, um, it's a it's a system that you know they feel uh, overwhelmed. They, uh, you know, there's a lack of resources for uh, for kids. Um, but it does seem like they're having some pretty clear conversations. There's some new positions that I know that um, uh, a couple of our JPOs are, are interviewing for as they kind of restructure it. Um, but yeah, I'd say uh, it, we talk, I work often with parents uh, as they go through the process because what they hear when they hear referrals uh, and they hear chins and they hear DCAF is, is DCYF is, is always negative. And I try to say, look, hey, here, this is one avenue towards resources that can help your family. 
it's it's not uh, just because a, a, a referral or a call was made doesn't mean that people are going to be coming into your home and, and, and grabbing your children. Here's some options for you. Uh, this is a great way for us to get help inside your home. Can you explain though that like the spectrum of like so ch like you just said you were in court twice a week for mm -hmm. chins. So like how many sort of like. Uh, we have kids coming to the office, then we sort of have chins, and then we have JPPO, the two cases, and then we have court, God forbid. Is that they're sort totally of like separate. They're totally separate. Yeah. Juvenile justice is totally separate. separate from the chins. He's not involved in that yeah. at all. Okay, That's but I guess I'm saying as far as like a spectrum of uh, discipline and behavior, right? Like, would you sort of like, things start escalating, so then you sort of provide, I just, so I kind of get it a little bit, but I think the board might not understand Liz, this sort of Can you clarify how, how, how is this relevant? How is this relevant, yeah, how is this to, relevant to the conversation? So I just want to respect their time. Yeah, so I guess, so, so we how have, are you linking this to what we're so trying what to I'm solve So what I'm linking for? is like, um, chins can be put in place or voluntary services can be put in place when kids have behaviors or disciplinary behaviors to sort of wrap them around and help the family and whatnot. So what I was trying to understand is sort of, we, you know, we have a officer Munson here that says, you know, we only have two cases that have sort of rise to this um, divergent piece or um, a, a juvenile divergence. But what I wanted to understand was like, are there, are we sort of wrapping kids around with voluntary services or these other things that are sort of happening yeah, so those are disciplinary two, wise? Two separate things. So they're not a school board yeah. policy. Right. So, so I understand that, but I, I guess what it I'm sounds like they have control of those programs in our middle schools. So I don't know if we need to have more of an explanation. No, it I'm sounds like these three gentlemen know how to work with that system, chins I'm and the not juvenile to get justice into the system. That's not what I was asking. What I was trying to get at is like, is that being used as part of this disciplinary behavior piece yes, or anything like that? Yes, it is. No. Yes. So no. chin, chins, is, no. chins is typically DCYF involvement right. and or truancy issues, and that okay. drives that, and it's a separate from a behavior or discipline issue. Okay. And so that's a, that's a DCYF matter. Court joins uh, the school, and, and Tim uh, will, will happily walk through. So that's just, so, but that's, just like a, that's like for, from disciplinary standpoint, that's just attendance and, um, and what else? Like we'll, issues at home. Like if issues they, at home. That's, okay, that's, that's not yeah. all. We are the part that we're they join the schools to that because in a typical most JPPOs will put in um, parts about attendance and good behavior and and maintaining um, you know okay. solid academics. So right. that's the only reason. That's just my role as the court liaison. Is I am unfortunately linked over there and get to go hang yeah. out with okay all right thank you <laughs> okay i just have it fortunately yeah i mean fortunately <laughs> uh, i get to go over there once twice a week because it operates right on time uh, <laughs> love those court days. yeah love those i think court you all know the way the school board works is we have a policy committee that establishes the policies and then the school board votes on the policies is there any policy disciplinary connected that you wish you had at the middle school that our policy committee could work on I guess you don't have to answer that question now. You could yeah. let Steve know. Yeah, we haven't. But is there that. any policy that you wish you had at the middle school regarding oh. discipline that you don't have? Or wish it, you didn't have? Oh, wish you didn't have. Yeah, that's a right. deeper that's, that's a yeah, deeper yeah, thought that's a than point. I have. It, it's yeah. something, I wish you didn't have. Something to contemplate, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, something to think about. Yeah. Be helpful. And the other, the, I just wanted to. I, my, my question was about drugs, alcohol, vaping, and weapons, and you uh, you addressed that. But I, I just have to tell you this one story. One day I was at the middle school years ago with John Stokel. What year was the middle school built? 1933. 1930. Yes. 1930. He took out a picture, and it was dated 1930. And it was a kid holding a rifle, you know, this high. He was going into the middle school. He put it in his locker, kept it there all day, because his grandfather would pick him up to go hunting after school mm -hmm. can you believe that no, that was pretty common if you look at new hampshire pre the pre columbine that was yeah. pretty common i worked yeah. in rural schools and we oh, yeah. we had similar yeah we had some guns systems. and the, you know he would they just bring, bring his loaded gun to school every friday because his grandfather would pick him up to go hunting <laughs> and my last question is equity <laughs> you know that's one of our our important goals for the school board do you feel that students are treated equitably with discipline at the middle school I mean, is, is every student treated the same? I think so. I do think so. Um, and, and I think given a lot of uh, 
opportunities and chances and that's been a it's been a kind of a key word and something we've been pushing uh, for a number of years and and again you, you remind people why they got into education in the first place and um, it, it's it's not a hard push uh, to get teachers on board with that and that's a goal for both him and I we tried to make sure that kids who either go to him or I for discipline that it's it's similar I mean it's not just like we dress the same which I look up there <laughs> <laughs> but oftentimes the memo this morning yeah, we're, kids, we're sure. we do laugh because our wow, sixth is really close. yeah isn't it weird? yeah uh, <laughs> Right now, my mom's trying to figure out who's who. Um, but uh, you know, oftentimes our sixth graders will come in and they'll confuse us, and that's kind of great because they're getting the same experience from both of us. So, um, you know, and I can't remember how many times I've been called the uh, the principal, uh, Principal Davis. Uh, and, and like any good, you know, community, they try to play one against the other and then find out, wait, you've got the same answers. Yeah. You know, so. Okay. Okay. Please well, tell me you. your mom's really on. I hope so. But. <laughs> we need to see this yeah, and no, I'll no, say no. hi. Yeah. You're going to say hi. <laughs> I don't know. She said, I told her it's only going to be 10 minutes. I'm not sure she went for the whole hour and a half. Uh, but. I was told I was told 10 minutes so if I could do a shout out to Rob I believe you're retiring after this year is yeah, that yeah, correct yeah. Rob's been around for a long time in our high school and our middle school and your service to our school community has just been exemplary thank you so much thank you we're gonna miss you I'll um, still be around yeah I'm yeah. gonna uh, you're be staying working. around here yeah, I'm going to be working with a uh, young man with autism. So, we, oh. And these guys are great. He's able to come in twice a week and work with our custodians. Uh, God bless our custodians because they're awesome. Um, and they take him on, and he works with them for a couple of hours, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I'm very fortunate that I'll be working with him. Oh, good. So, yeah, oh, fantastic. Wait. And you do wonderful work with Special Olympics. I love them. And Friends in Action, um, which are organizations I'm familiar with, obviously. So thank you. Thank you for thank your you. many years of service. And thank you to Phil and Tim, too. I, yeah. You guys are too young to be in his shoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think she just called you old. I did. <laughs> old. Old. We're the same age, yes. actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. just, he's just much better looking. Okay. Uh, uh, right. uh, well, thank you very much for you. coming. Thank you, gentlemen, for thank your you. time thank thank you. and your patience. <laughs> okay, we will move on to... Um, Superintendent's report. All right. Um, well, first off, I have to say I'm jealous about confusing between the two of them because the only comment I've ever gotten was from a student who said, are you Mr. Shea's dad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. How old is the student? Uh, well, <laughs> elementary. Uh, <laughs> it stings to this day, yeah. Nick. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, in your, uh, in your report, you have the email correspondence uh, summary uh, for the email that you've received. Again, not a ton uh, there, but you can see uh, the email still trailing some of the themes that you've heard from the, about the discipline policies in the committee. Uh, also, some uh, feedback on um, the uh, math tutor position at the middle school and the high school principal search, something to talk about in a little bit. Um, and then you have the May edition of the board and administrator, as well as the policy committee minutes for April 13th. Um, I would share with you, and under correspondence, uh, we have a letter of retirement from one of our science teachers, Jeff Gardner, and uh, I'm personally very sad to see, but yes, a letter of resignation from my, uh, my younger sister <laughs> <laughs> <Mr>. Shea. <laughs> so, uh, so you have that in your packet as well. George, we're sorry to see you go. We wish you the best of luck. Thank You've you. been a wonderful, wonderful assistant superintendent for us and an elementary school principal. And what else were you? Uh, Computer teacher. Computer <laughs> teacher. Computer teacher. Harbor, yes. Okay. So we, we wish you the very best. Thank you. Um, we think you're going to be the next Steve Jobs or something. Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, he's going to get into that computer stuff and keep working. And from, so. from SAU 15, George, thank you for working so closely with Kelly Killen, our assistant superintendent, and aligning, um, you know, sort of how we look at the high school data in our districts. So thank, thank you. Thank you. That was very nice. Okay. 
Uh, what else do you have? So, uh, well, on to old business, I suppose. Yeah. You have the consideration approval for the board meeting dates. These dates are uh, as they have been for uh, multiple years. Of course, you are, you, you do meet the second and fourth Tuesday of the month, and so this is the schedule as would follow that. Um, the question, probably for a later time, um, historically you have had meetings at the school buildings, which I, I do think has a certain benefit, especially when you're there seeing certain things. Uh, but we also have had this dual platform uh, Zoom interface that has been important mm -hmm. in the last year plus uh, since we've come back to in-person meetings. So if the intent is to keep that hybrid format with Zoom, um, as we've seen already, it can present a challenge moving around locations. So um, a conversation you'll probably want to have uh, this summer and setting up the locations for the meetings next year would be to how much you want to continue this dual platform. Uh, but you're not voting on the, lo you don't have to worry about the locations. That's a conversation you can continue to have. You have just traditionally voted the dates for the meeting so they can be publicized and put out and communicated to the community. So you want us to vote on this? So yes. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the proposed meeting dates for 2022-23? I just have a quick. Oh, sorry. Oh, Questions okay. Do we have a we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Yes. Question. Uh, so remind me, please. This is June 13th, which is a I feel like a little late in June. Um, what's our last day of school? Just just in, there's like end of year business or. Are you talking for next June? Like, yes. Because um, I think this year we're, we're June 9th, and which is a, almost a week and a half or two weeks before the end of school on the 16th. So, yes, yeah, so you have, you're talking about the difference between graduation? I'm talking about our, our June 13th meeting. Yeah, that would probably that, be a that week. That seems late probably, to yeah. me for June for. I'm not sure that would be a Tuesday. You probably would run into that following week with students. I think it, I think the student day is a little bit later next year, so you're still well within the school year. You, it's not after students. Um, well, I knew it wasn't after students. I just don't want it to be the last week of school. Yeah, right. Sometimes right. there are issues that we need to adjust, and once people are out for the summer, it's right. very difficult to have if we need staff or someone to be at that meeting or something. So right. that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, no, that's likely to be the Tuesday after the Friday graduation, which I think traditionally is what it's been. Okay. And we do the second Tuesday, and that's just, the second Tuesday. That it's just happens 13th. to be the latest second Tuesday you yeah, can you, say. You can possibly yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, but it is the second it is Tuesday. Than usual. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, any other discussion? Yes, Liz. Um, the only, I mean, obviously I mentioned Valentine's Day, but I don't care because I'm very single. But um, the, <laughs> <laughs> the um, November 8th meeting, um, that I think that's a no school day because it's an election day, right? So I guess um, my only concern with that, you know, not that I care to, you know, be here on election night. I'll, I'll be fine being here on election night. But I guess I'm wondering about having some of our admin come in when they've had the day off, they can just go ahead and have the day off, I guess, unless they plan on. Maybe you work that day. Yeah, I was going to say they would enjoy the day off, Liz, but that actually is a work day. Work day. For, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the, as long as it's not going to be a conflict, I guess. Uh, yeah. that'd be the only I actually would point. thought we talked about moving that off of Election Day when we last yeah, had the calendar on the agenda. Too. I don't think we want to encourage people to miss voting to come to the school board meeting. Yeah. We didn't but, talk about well, these. Well, it end at 7. Yeah. 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 Well, but we're meeting at 6, 6 30. I mean, how, I don't know. That only affects people who are working in the polls. Right. right. Or how to I mean, are they going to be taking up the city? I mean, nobody's going to be taking up the city, yeah, it's, it's not a city election, right? It obviously has happened before. Um, yeah. but no problem. Okay. We can shift so our time, start time as well. We usually start at 7. Yeah, we start yeah, at 7, so in the polls mind. close shift at 7. <laughs> right. Um, well, they w God forbid uh, we have a shorter meeting now. <laughs> That's right. That's, I don't know. Um, how do people feel about that? Do we want to change November 8th? When when would you want to change it to? I mean, November twenty second. So skip a Thanksgiving skip week. So we call it our fall break. Well, I was supposed to meet twice a month. Is there know. a holiday that week? Is that I I vacation it was at least weeks? Once a month. Vacation months. I think we just look at shifting the time. Like Can we pass it for now and then just look at amending it later if we need to? Yeah, I was going to say, you yeah, have the right sleepy. to know while you're, <laughs> as long as you're within the posting yeah. uh, law, you yeah. can change anything. All right. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll pass this as it is, and then if that comes up again, we'll discuss it. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Okay, motion passes. Okay, and we'll keep that November 8th in mind. Okay. Next, consideration and approval of employment, new business. Uh, yeah, thank you. We are pleased to be uh, nominating to you tonight the next Portsmouth High School principal. Um, we're very pleased to be nominating Stephen Kenosi to you. Stephen comes to us most recently from Andover Public Schools in Andover, Massachusetts as the Director of Strategic Innovation. Uh, he served in a similar uh, central capacity as Chief Innovation <coughs> Officer for the Newton Public Schools. It has a long history of teaching in various capacities at the high school level. Uh, comes to us with a master's in English from University of Wyoming and a bachelor's in English from Plymouth State University. Uh, and uh, as I think you all know, but for the benefit of the community, uh, this is the culmination of a, of a pretty intensive and lengthy search process uh, that began with canvassing the community of leadership qualities and a profile to guide the search committee's initial efforts. That search committee was made up of various stakeholders and went through the process of reviewing all of the applications for the position uh, to eventually whittle down to two finalists and those two finalists going through a process of site visits both in their place of work as well as having them come to our high school uh, and go through again a process involving multiple stakeholders, Zoom opportunities for parents and community, uh, meeting with students, meeting with staff, uh, and then uh, the search committee gaining all of that feedback back. And so uh, the search committee had met again at the end of last week to review all of the feedback, offer their last pieces of input. Uh, and from there, George, myself, and Zach uh, have been going through a process of sif sifting through all of that feedback, um, certainly going through and digging even further into uh, references, and in the case of Steve, talking to more people uh, in his place of work. Um, and we just came away with a lot of resounding um, positives for Steve's candidacy. The site visit down there was very, very impressive. Uh, and we, um, we do uh, look forward to his leadership at Portsmouth High School. Again, I think, with, uh, I think he, he had a good frame of thinking around innovation, of how to incrementally improve, uh, and also to acknowledge the many great things that already exist at Portsmouth High School and the strength and potential of the staff there. So uh, a lot of that, I know, is going to feed into um, some revisioning processes with the high school, uh, and, uh, and we're excited to bring forward his nomination to you. Thank you. Do we have a motion to um, accept Steve's nomination? So moved. Second. Second. Any comments, questions? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And thank you for SAU 50's um, participation in that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, Steve, to our high school. Very good. Yes, he is. Another Steve. Another yeah. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, two leave of absences requests for you. The first uh, request uh, for you is, is actually from Ann Dickey, and for the, the balance of this year, uh, Ann is out right now on the. Uh, and then the second request, and you're free to take them together, I suppose, is a request from uh, Caitlin Moore Cusack uh, for next year uh, leave of absence. I have one question on Miss um, mm -hmm. Smallers. Mm -hmm. um, it, this sounds very typical of a sabbatical, and I know that we previously had seen a sabbatical. I was just curious what the, if this didn't qualify or. I, I'm very supportive. I just yeah no you you're right on point. Yeah, I thought Carrie, so too. which is this is this is a pro when when we looked at this proposal we realized that her experience with this leave of absence will come back with great benefit for us mm -hmm. and what she would be bringing back because it is very sabbatical ish. In fact, it would probably fit pretty well into that frame. I don't think it was an application for this year, uh, and she's not she had no expectation of asking for that. But um, but I do think it's gratuitous to have. Uh, leave of absence that's going to come mm -hmm. back, particularly with the area of outdoor ed experience. Mm -hmm. Do we have a mo Oh, go I have ahead. a question. So I, I'm curious, was any conversation had with her? Um, currently, she's social studies, if I science, science, science yes, yeah, science from um, middle school around 
if her interest will stay science when she returns or um, is she interested in transitioning to outdoor ed as we have that kind of on our future agenda so I'm just wondering how that might play out yeah so great question uh, as you know we have uh, right now teed up and using ESSER funds an outdoor ed position focused primarily at the elementary level um, I think a conversation for subsequent budgets for this board would be is this a structure we want to expand mm -hmm. And if your contemplation was an outdoor ed person for the middle school, obviously mm -hmm. she'd be a wonderful candidate if, if that were something that were available. But um, but it is, I, mean, I guess the basic point is this is an area of initiative to the district, so it's going to contribute. Okay, great, thank you. Do we have a motion to accept these two? Um, okay, I moved. Second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, thank you. Do we have any committee updates? No committee updates. We had an SAU 50, um, what do we call that? Advi the secondary advisory meeting slash area meeting. We had yes. it all together. Yes. <laughs> so um, we met with Sal for the last time. Is that the last yes, time so we'll meet yeah, with that, Sal? Yes, will be the last time. Uh, he's correct. the superintendent yeah. of SAU 50, and he will be retiring. And um, what's the man's name that's oh, taking yeah. this place? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that it's a really a nice meeting. I, you know, being on the school board for so long, I already always knew that committee existed but never participated in it and it really is a wonderful exchange of ideas and thoughts about what's going on at SAU 50 and um, it, 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 they're, they're productive meetings I think Mary Lyons makes a big presentation about what's going on at Portsmouth High School so Steve will obviously Steve Chinozzi will take over that role um, when uh, when when he comes so it's a, it's a, an informative meeting and it's a, we have a good chemistry we have a nice um, rapport going. So so thank you for coming tonight. Do you have anything to report from SAU 50? I don't. We are looking forward to continuing the relationship. <laughs> OK. Steve, yes, Hope. Could you just give a quick update on Lister's position? Yeah, thank you. Um, so just quickly, so we are uh, about a week behind the high school in finding our next uh, Lister Academy program director. Uh, again, a multi-stakeholder committee has done the work of initial screening applicants, interviews, had chosen uh, three finalists uh, for that position, three strong finalists. Uh, one of those finalists has accepted an offer somewhere else, so we have two finalists now, um, and uh, we will be visiting uh, one of their places of work, uh, one site visit tomorrow in Sanborn and another site visit up in South Portland on Thursday. So we do hope to have some closure to that in the next few days. Thank you. Carrie. Um, from the Futures Board, um, just thinking, or, or Advisory Board, um, New Hampshire Gives is coming up in June, and they are interested in um, matching donors to help boost funds. So if any board members know of any opportunities or donors that would like to do that, and then I'll circulate to board members to get the word out when that comes. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Anyone else for committee updates? Okay. Um, future agenda, uh, what do we have? Future agenda items. Um, we're going to talk about field trips, policy changes, yeah, creation of redistricting committee, the K through 12 mm -hmm. disciplinary procedures. Our next meeting, we'll have the elementary school stakeholders mm -hmm. talk about discipline at the elementary school. So that will happen on um, May 24th. The superintendent superintendent transition. Are you going to talk about that? It's at the, our next meeting. Oh uh, yeah, we can we can okay. update how we can do that. Nancy, and, I do still have new business as well. <laughs> oh, okay. Can I just finish this while? I, and ESSER funds usage. Nathan, is that why you put this in our packets? Do you want us oh, to look at all? Oh, you know what? Those this is an old one. Two of, it's an old one. Two of you have oh, okay. two of you were remote, and I threw that in your box so that you'd have that to replace whatever we did that night before. Okay. Sorry. Okay. What about this future? Yes, I wanted to add the language. Um, Hope requested a long time ago, and uh, we need to um, put it in the um, language us uh, uh, language in the starting in the elementary schools. So can we add that yeah. to our yeah. um, future agenda items? Consulate. 
Yes, yes what with, with our Italian. Yeah. Um, yeah. Elementary, world language, um, elementary world language is another future agenda item, and we should get that on soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we can get it on at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. And then the field trips. I'm sorry. What is that about? Why is that? On Brian our had asked for that. He just wanted an explanation of how the field trips come to be, how kids are chosen to go on the field trips. If you don't have money to pay for the field trip, what happens? So he just wanted some background information about field trips. Okay, Lisa and Ann. You can go ahead, Ann. Uh, well, I was looking for information about graduation events. I had the, uh, Jack McGee is usually gives out the, a the Yale Book Award, and he wondered if there was to having baccalaureate. I said, I'm assuming they are, but I haven't heard anything about it. Yeah, you Mary, get a whole big yeah Mary, it, it should be coming in your next packet for sure. Mary yep. uh, has had that at our secondary advisory meeting, and so we can get that out to you. And the graduation is outside, correct? Uh, we, uh, that is the plan. Um, we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we are looking at, obviously, we have, want to have multiple contingencies. But. So it's not set. Right. Is there a Data plan set. B if it rains? If it's well, that's just on. Yeah, you have to have a plan B. <laughs> that yeah. is the complication of outside. Right, right. right. The right. Is set. But the date is set. The date is set, yes. Lisa, right. did you have something? I did have new business. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. I forgot. I'm sorry, Lisa. Sorry. Um, I had wanted to make a motion to address something that's moving through the New Hampshire legislature at this time. I know that this board, as a general rule, does not get involved in politics, but this particular piece of legislation, I think, runs very counter to our district policies and all of our goals around equity and wellness and opportunity and community. Um, the bill is House Bill 1431, which establishes a parental bill of rights. It has passed the state senate with some amendments and been kicked back to the House where it's up for a vote this Thursday. And if it passes, it goes to the gov governor's desk for signature. Um, there are many, many, many problematic aspects of this um, bill in my point of view. It would restrict a lot what our teachers are allowed to d teach and discuss. It would remove any right to privacy for any student who goes to the nurse or a guidance counselor to disclose anything about their health. It's particularly damaging to LGBT kids who would be outed to their parents if they disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity in school and any number of other things that are pretty problematic ending with and we can have anybody in the community parent or not sue people if they don't like whatever they think is going on in our schools so it's pretty divisive and damaging and I would like to propose that we as a board pretty quickly throw together a letter that we send to our Portsmouth representatives in the House stating our opposition if people in the board feel that that's something we can unanimously support. Obviously, if we can't, so be it, but... Can you talk um, about how the um, School Board Association and the The School Board Association opposes it, the NEA New Hampshire opposes it, the ACLU opposes it, you know, I was notified of it for a Seacoast outright, listserv, any number of education, medical, community groups who support students, teachers, um, <laughs> you know, healthcare in the state oppose this bill. I mean, the list is all public. I did email you earlier in the day just a link to the bill, a link to just what NEA NH has to say about it. Obviously, you can all make up your own minds, but my recommendation would be that we draft a very short letter that follows pretty closely the very simple reasons that the teachers union has already laid out for why this is a pretty terrible idea for our schools, and perhaps just add a sentence or two to note that this is very much in opposition to our district policies, our goals, and our values here in Portsmouth, because I just think this is one situation where we should really stand up for our teachers and our kids as a board. So we did do that as a board before We've done it this before. board on the device. I remember that. And this yeah. is really a broadening of device. This is even worse. So, it like takes well, that and just saying. kind of makes it's, it like a more nuclear so option. I think it's, it's, I'm just saying it's consistent with our last board's yeah. decision around and device. I know time, when I was on the city council, several times we wrote letters to Concord opposing <laughs> something. I don't remember what it was now, but we've, we did it several times. So I don't know so if this is policy for how we've done this in the past. But given this is going to a vote on Thursday and we don't want to sit here till midnight writing three paragraphs as a group, I would like to make a motion that I can just draft a few quick sentences and email it out to the board for people to review and weigh in and approve. And then I don't know if it would be signed by all of us or if certain people don't want to sign it and want to do their own letters, that's fine. I don't know how we did the divisive concepts one. 
We signed off as the superintendent and the chair as representatives okay. of all of SAU 52. So then we would have to take a vote, I guess, in concept if everybody is comfortable with the board signing off on that. And it would be to go to all of our Portsmouth representatives while it's pending in the House. And if it passes the House, it would also be to send a letter immediately to Sununu's office. Second. Second that. <laughs> can we send it to the entire house? Yeah. I mean, you can if you want. Yes. yes. I think I we think should. Yeah, I, I, that's yeah, fine. I think we should. It doesn't cost anything, and it's already written. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have the largest state legislature in the country, don't we? We do. So it's a lot of. It's uh, kind of insane. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, I would just ask that the letter be included in our next packet so the public can be aware of what was sent. Good idea. That's a great idea. Okay, so Lisa, can you um, draft the letter? Yeah. Yeah, okay. and I mean, okay. I don't want to take Send up. The, to I did email everybody with the union road. I mean, I don't okay. want to take up too much time tonight over yeah. this, but no. Why don't you draft something? Okay. get it to us, and it uh, it sounds like everyone is pretty much in agreement yeah, with this. So, so we would still yes, need to put it to, to a vote. vote. Yeah. We had a first from Pip. Do we have yeah. a second? No, she's the first. No, I was she's the, the second. First. Pip's oh, yeah. oh, okay. That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion passes. So you'll get to us as soon as you can, and then we'll just. Authorize you to send it out. You Wouldn't want to come from the chair or our superintendent? Chair, superintendent, yeah. I believe. Oh, the chair oh and the all right. So yeah. you can get it out for us then. Yep. yep. Okay. Okay. Yes, Liz. Um, I had a motion that I had uh, asked about last week, but I just wanted to touch on a point, um, or sort of ask uh, Steve to sort of expand on it. So I don't know if I should make the motion, see if there's a second, and then discuss, or if we could just discuss prior to whether I'd make the motion or not. My question really lies in wanting to eliminate the sentence um, in the IGD policy surrounding in the presence of, um, and what that effect, if, you know, if we were to eliminate that today, would that have a positive effect so that um, going into graduation season and everything else, there's not these discrepancies and issues that can that could potentially continue to arise throughout graduation season um, you know or would it if or would doing that right now cause more questions than um, addressing issues and, and and if that's the case is there another way that we could motion or do something so that Maybe we're not eliminating the policy now. Maybe we sort of rework or look at things that are in our retreat and you know have something in the handbook and maybe have a handbook that doesn't have this language in it for next year, but you know something to the effect of not enforcing this versus removing the policy or something that I guess I'm just I'm a little bit concerned that obviously we're COVID's you know, unfortunately it hasn't moved past us, but it's kind of passed and we're having in-person graduation, in-person things, and, and kids haven't had that for a long time. So I, I wonder if this is, this, you know, maybe it, maybe this set the tone, as the speaker said tonight, that, you know, people saw this happen to other kids and they're not gonna do X, Y, Z, but the reality is, is I think kids are hanging out more, we may see more of this, and I guess I just wonder, because what I wanna eliminate is not so much the kids doing, you know, I obviously don't want kids doing these things, but what I want to eliminate is all this sort of discrepancy and back and forth about what this means and, and you know, basically the, the issues that sort of came up at the last meeting. And, and so I, I'm wondering if you could speak to any of that. Yeah, thanks, Liz. So I, I, if you're looking for a recommendation for me, I would say don't just take one piece of that policy in isolation and just remove that particular language. I think we need to look at that policy in its full context and to think through different scenarios that could come from a change. So um, so I, I would suggest your latter, which is to say, let's do a, a retreat or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, I think we should look at the whole policy as a whole, regardless of whether we eliminate this sentence or right. not. But I also but. want to clarify something so not it's not misunderstood. So even the, um, the behavior contemplated in that policy, which again affects their participation in things like sports, has no bearing on being able to go to graduation, for example. So when you say graduate, we're coming up to graduation week activities. Oh, no, yeah, that's I not what I don't I want to was... have there be an impression out there that that would have been well, an effect. That's a good right. to clarify. I guess I was more thinking of, like, people are spending more time together. Kids right. are getting right. together again. Not that they weren't getting together before, but I think, you know, maybe getting together in larger groups and home, you know, 
families are having get-togethers and families are having parties with their kids there and all this sort of stuff. So there's a lot more that could happen. And then if we did decide to change the policy for next year, I guess my question, my next question to you is if we did decide to change the policy for next year, if kids got wrapped up in this language or in this policy and we ended up changing it, they would still would they still be affected next year come sports season or whatnot because essentially this policy rolls over right yeah so we would and this could this would be a discussion of the board obviously but in terms of how it takes effect but in the last iteration of change we mm -hmm. did we applied it to to students who were even for an infraction prior so under the old policy so for example the new policy as we've talked about had a little more restorative element you could reduce your suspension if you did this this and this that applied even to students who were caught under the previous policy so i would assume that would be similar okay so it's not like set in stone and right. we could sort of um, right. decide if we were going to change how we would deal with prior incidents essentially all right, if I, could, if I could just say something as the chair of the board. We have a process, we have a procedure. We always go through our policy committee, okay? So for Liz, if you, if you don't mind me saying, I think it's inappropriate to make a motion trying to eliminate a policy without it going through our policy committee first. I, I, That's the practice that we've always had. Now, it's not carved in stone. We don't have to do it, mm -hmm. but that's the procedure and in the, in the way that this board operates. So we're doing all this study now about our discipline policies. The next step is to have it go to the policy committee and have the policy committee make a rec recommendation to the board. The board has the final vote. So to make a motion like that, in my opinion is inappropriate mm -hmm. it's not the way the process has gone for decades it's not carved in stone anywhere so I suppose somebody could make a motion like that if they wanted to but it certainly isn't why do we have a policy committee if we're gonna make motions during meetings eliminating policies why do we have a policy committee mm -hmm. That's part of the structure of the school board. So that's just my two cents worth of that. Lisa, Nick, and Hope. I'm gonna let Nick go first, because yeah. he hasn't talked at all tonight. <laughs> oh, sorry. But, um, Don't be sorry. Yeah, I and mean, even setting aside the policy committee aspect of it, I just, I also feel like it sets something of a poor precedent if we make a motion before having completed the process as we perceive it. I mean, we obviously do have uh, at least one more um, informational meeting on this and I also think that uh, it doesn't look great for us if we um, just kind of change the policy as a direct result of a meeting where I, although I agree I think the general agreement was against the policy I don't think there was by any means a consensus I don't think there was an, any real agreement as to what part of the policy exactly a majority of people were against. It seemed like there were a lot of different complaints about it, and so I think getting rid of one piece of it based on what feels to me like questionable um, evidence feels like it's setting a really bad precedent for mm -hmm. um, potential future policy discussions as well as also just not mm -hmm. necessarily being a well-advised decision on this one. So Nick, you Lisa. teed me up really well because it was kind of a question for said. Steve. <laughs> I really agree with Liz that there are many problems with this policy. I mean, I really feel for the kids and the teachers who would maybe have to contend with it if we make an abrupt change a couple weeks before the end of school. So that's a little concerning to me. But I think we should not kick the can down the road and we really should put it on the agenda for the retreat and we should mm -hmm. think very seriously about what are any substantial but thoughtful steps that we might take over the summer if we think it's correct and we have buy-in from the administrators to make some changes. My question for you, Steve, though, is I don't see anything in a lot of these policies that spells out that this is a high school policy or a middle school policy or an elementary school policy, and we haven't heard from elementary yet, but we've clearly heard very different perspectives from high school and middle school in terms of how these policies affect them. So I'm wondering if you can just speak to that a little bit, because if we're talking about changing these, I don't want to change a policy with the high school in mind that makes you know life harder for Phil. I don't want to try to impose something that he's doing on the high school if they don't think that makes sense for their situation. But it seems really confusing to me from the outside looking in to go, wait, it's the same policy. Why are we hearing very different things about how it's playing out? Yeah, so does just, that make any just, sense? It I mean, does. So just to be clear, we've been focused primarily on that one policy for extracurriculars. We have other discipline-related policies 
that we haven't put on the table yet, which would probably speak even more to your point, which is what's the consistency factor? Whereas this policy is, by its nature, thankfully, <laughs> primarily a high school policy, which we don't have middle sixth graders generally. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> out at the underage drinking parties. Right. So, and the question that, that Phil and Tim referred to around, well, do we have uh, disciplinary consequences in school for things that kids do out of school it was, it was certainly an important question, but I just want to be clear, for the things they were talking about that they don't discipline in school, generally the high school doesn't either, right? So we're again talking about this policy that's very specific to underage drinking. Et Fair. So, um, so I, I don't think, I guess it's a long way of saying, I don't think there's as much inconsistency as you're, you're seeing in that. Okay. Uh, but it's a fair question. I think putting all of the disciplinary policies on the table together probably would be a helpful component in this conversation rather than keep coming back to that one very high school focused Sentence. policy. Fair. Right. Hope. Um, so I, I, I just want to say I do appreciate Liz bringing it up. And I didn't feel that she's just trying to push through a motion. I did hear you, Liz, say that you're welcome to put a discussion on the table. So I appreciate you putting it out there for discussion. Um, I, I do understand your concerns around, you know, I feel kind of both sides of the coin, if you will. On one side, we've seen how this directly <coughs> and negatively can impact our students, so we can't unknow what we know. And so I think we do have to ask ourselves, and Steve, I know I've spoken to you about this after our last high school meeting, um, you know, is there a way to suspend the enforcement of the language? I don't think you can ins suspend the enforcement of a language of, in the presence of if, you, if we don't know then what are we going to enforce? Are we going to enforce intoxication, you know, and and other components uh, very specifically? So if we don't know what we're going to enforce, then I would caution us of suspending anything at this moment. It certainly, I would use the word suspend versus complete elimination of. I also don't know legally if we can just suspend one component of it. That would be a question for Kathleen. But I do have concern around listening to our disciplinary committee. I do not want to see another event come up at the high school. And I think that's what I hear Liz saying. There's, there's a road ahead of us where that could happen. And we know the outcome of that. And we've already done a lot of work, I think, in looking at the negative components and the positive components of the outcomes. So I, I would like to see, from a superintendent standpoint, um, coming alongside our disciplinary committee around this policy at the high school till the end of the year um, so that they can know they, they ha where the wiggle room is, I guess. Um, and um, I don't want to see our disciplinary committee faced with another incident where they feel like this is the policy, my hands are tied, I feel like there's some components here that could be, I, I would rather see that be a discussion with our superintendent. Um, and then just in terms of the policy committee, you know, we haven't had workshops like this around discipline. In. You know, we've had blue ribbon set aside committees, but not like this with the, so, I want to just caution us that we've been doing it this way forever. Just because something's done forever doesn't mean that it has to continue to be done that way. So, you know, and this district has seen that more and more in new innovative ways. So I just want to keep an open mind as we approach it, but I do agree that it's helpful to go through the whole process and, um, and look at it from a broader standpoint of discipline our approach to discipline because in my personal opinion I have a lot of problems with ICD beyond just the substance um, components and the responsibility that kids are being held to um, that may not be drinking because I think it's it goes against um, our student wellness goal it, it goes against our equity goal I mean we are targeting a specific number of students because it's with athletes and clubs and so if you're not in those things, we're basically saying to those students, you're at a different set of standards. And I don't think that's what we want to set. I think we want to look at a policy. It may mean wiping this one in a different way and drafting something new. But we want to look at a policy that says, if you're a clipper, these are the standards. And it doesn't really matter what you belong to. 
you know, what you're participating in, these are the standards if you're a Portsmouth Clipper. Right. I don't think we should get into a discussion about the policy now. Okay. I think we've made the decision. We're not going to eliminate that particular phrase right now <clears throat> at this time. We're going to continue with our disciplinary um, process where we have the meeting in May with the elementary schools. Um, my recommendation is going to be that it go back to the policy committee, but if the board decides they don't want to do it that way, then I guess we don't have to do it that way. That's the way we've always done it. But And then the policy committee will come back to the board and we'll deliberate. So that's, I think that if, if this pertains to the policy, I'd like to end the discussion. I just have one okay. follow-up question I think is important for Steve. Uh, my question is that um, as we go into a school year that starts in August and we print handbooks that would start for that school year, um, the reality may be that we're not going to be able to revamp the entire, um, these entire policies prior to implementing into the handbook. And so my question to you is, um, maybe you can come back to, to us with more information about this, but like, uh, by what date is does the handbook go to printing and by what date would we need to sort of finalize this so therefore maybe we could actually get on a timeline you know for meeting with the elementary schools next you know uh, is there an opportunity like what is the timeline we're looking at and like are we if we don't have time to revamp everything then maybe we decide to go for sections and then can whatever it ha like what's the timeline I guess yeah so well I mean there, there's the old timeline and the new timeline the old timeline is hard prints when does it go out and we get the prints back we have always had policies that change somewhere midstream and so then it's about re-education and again most of our handbooks now that they're in an online format it's just to change the link kind of thing so um, so I don't see a problem with being a with the handbook and being able to make sure the policy is well communicated okay. Carrie, can you make it quick? Because I'd like to end this discussion. I see two separate issues with this policy and then the overall. I think we talked about the disciplinary piece before. Um, I don't know that anything is going to change in our opinions about I ICD. IGD. Sorry. Um, I, I would recommend that this be on the agenda for the May 17th policy committee meeting to address. Uh, yeah, it is. I, it, yeah, and, it already is. And ideally with recommendations, I think the disciplinary philosophy is a longer process, but I don't see any reason why a discussion with elementary needs to wait for the policy committee right. to make They could come back at a, a next meeting with a recommendation. The policy committee could. Their meeting is the 17th. So yes, mm -hmm. it's been on there for <coughs> some time, I believe. Correct. It just got moved to the 20th now. At 8 a.m. Oh, but when that's it. But that's before our next school so board meeting. Yes. Oh, I can't that's make that one. That's why I'm hoping 20th at 8 a.m. is the <laughs> policy committee meeting. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's, in, it's in flex. Okay. And it will be It'll happen before, the before next our meeting. next board meeting. We yeah. so. just put that in the, on the agenda yeah. regardless. Yes. Well. It'll be updated online. And when, okay. are, when are we having the next presentation for? May 24th. For, it's the 24th right. the elementary school. Elementary school. Okay, so then will we so. be able to have a follow-up conversation as a board? Would that be? Well, let's see what the policy the committee might come back with something. Okay. So, well, well so those are two separate. Yeah. I think Hope's asking about discipline in general. Right. And you're speaking to the IGD in specific, in particular. I think it all depends upon how much progress is made in the policy committee meeting. I don't want to make any promises because I'm, I'm not sure clearness will be reached in okay, one so meeting. We'll discuss it at the May 24th board meeting then we'll about what the next step will be um, as far as the discipline policy goes. But maybe the policy committee will have a recommendation by our next meeting. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Kim, would you like to say anything about what's going on at the high school sure. as the teacher um, representative? Well, let's see. Couple things. May 21st is the Seaco Spring Market, so um, there'll be lots of artisans uh, vending outside at Christmas High School. I think we have over 50 vendors. Wow. Um, there are a ton of students, though. So if you want to support um, our students, we have amazing artists, as you all <coughs> know. Some of them going to RISD and like really amazing places. So uh, they will be there. That's the 21st at what time, Kim? Uh, it's 10 to 2. Okay, thank you. Um, Juneteenth is um, going to be on a Monday this year, which is our last day of school for teachers. I just want to put a little blurb out there that it is now a national um, holiday, mm -hmm. as well as a state-recognized um, holiday. So 
I did have a couple of teachers ask me if um, how that was going to work. So obviously that wasn't on our school calendar this year, but perhaps we could somehow think about that next year. Um, last year was on a Saturday, so um, I think we were out of school by then. I know we were. Um, but anyway, so that's a thing. Um, secondly, on the, um, I'm not going to bring the policy back up, but just for a second, in that seniors have a ton of meetings. So in terms of those parties, um, if we could, you know, just have our admin make it clear to the students that this policy is still in existence, it's not going away, and yes, you might be impacted in your fall sport, um, and just really hammer that in. It might take, you know, several announcements to, to really make those students know and responsible for each other. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about, you know, shoulder to shoulder and just being like, not a good idea, let's not do that. You have a contract, you have this with athletics, you have this with NHS. So um, I, I think they would do it anyway, but maybe it just needs to be said every, every time they walk around a corner. <laughs> um, but yeah, and you're gonna speak about the play, right? Oh yes, uh, so uh, the school play um, coming up has been announced to be uh, Sondheim on Sondheim. Um, it seems like we've got a lot of uh, very excited people working on it, uh, and uh, yeah. That's May 21st. It, when is that? May 21st? Yeah. Right. Okay. So it'll be a busy day over there at the high it, school. It, is it at night? Uh, I yep. believe, yeah, the, the, okay. they generally have the shows on evenings. Okay. 7 p.m. I think. Say air? I guess you wouldn't say air. In, Perform. We got an email about the Portsmouth 400, the education group that oh, the two, uh, two high school students are working on. Yeah. That's coming along very well. It's coming along. The interviews are going great. Um, we, we're, still, <laughs> we're still working with the arborist. Um, he's going to be around, I think. He, he didn't show up for the last meeting, but um, yeah. So that's, that's one of the other things, is planting the 400 trees. Um, and we a good site for doing our uh, video production of the oral histories, our, our team. Yeah, I uh, saw that. Trying mm -hmm. to find a stable site instead of going to people's houses, although some of these people have trouble getting around, so we might have to go to some. What about the library? Uh, do they have a video? video? Yeah, that's a good point. They do. I'll, we I'll we had that. great luck with it. Earlier. Oh, okay. room. The, um, you can do it in the Levin. No, I get the names confused. Oh, I'll email you. Okay, thank you. The Levinson's yeah. downstairs. That's, that's, that's not the Lord room. Room. Downstairs. Yeah. It's the Hilton upstairs. Yeah, in the McLeod, isn't McLeod upstairs McLeod, too? Yeah. There are yeah, two of them upstairs. But I don't Children's. think there's a yeah. <laughs> The library owns one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you yeah. have anything else? Um. No. Not really, I guess. Um, we do have some environmental students who are working on some things, and um, we went to the big town, no, big oil, small town. I don't know if you guys heard about that presentation, but um, it was really good, um, and they did bring up that a similar incident might be happening at the Pease Trade Port in terms of a cargo center. Mm -hmm. um, so you might see some environmental activism with trying to get in touch with Dudley Dudley um, and just have her come to the school and maybe redo her presentation and yeah it's, that will create quite a few um, problems in terms of noise does, pollution. Does everyone pollution. know who Dudley Dudley is? She's the one that prevented Aristotle Onassis from building an oil so good. right off of Durham's oh, shore. That's going back many years. Yeah. The, the presentation was yeah, amazing. I if she comes, yeah, I, I will let you know, awesome. and you can yeah. hop on over and, and see what she has to say. Well, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Oh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 What will they do for another hour? We'll see everybody on May 24th. <laughs> Time flies. Oh, another hour. Can you believe it's going to be the end of May? I know. I know it.